On Tuesday, we were talking about the historic fundamentalists, the rise of fundamentalism, and really fundamentalism in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century here in North America was a response among Bible-believing Christians as they refuted and rejected the error of liberalism, which was gaining ground within the mainline denominations. In the 19th century, the mainline denominations were Bible-believing denominations. So to be a Baptist, a Presbyterian, or a Methodist meant that you embraced and believed the Bible. But as we get into the 20th century, many in those mainline denominations are arguing that we need a more modern version of Christianity for modern culture, and liberalism is gaining great strides within those denominations. And liberal theologians are starting to assert their influence. And the result is that the mainline denominations are deteriorating into really skepticism and unbelief. Liberalism, again, is an attempt to call yourself a Christian but not believe the Bible. I think that's the simplest definition of what liberalism is. And uh, we see that trend, that downward trend, taking place in the early 20th century in North America. And Bible-believing, conservative Christians are taking a stand against that trend, and they become known as the fundamentalists because they are rallying around the fundamentals of the faith. So the fundamentalists are those who rally around the fundamentals of the faith, and we saw those five fundamentals in particular being the historic inerrancy, uh, yeah, the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture, the historic understanding of that, the virgin birth of Christ, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the authentic miracles of Christ, and the bodily resurrection of Christ being the five core fundamentals that these Bible-believing Christians were rallying around to defend. And they were doing that because that was the primary point of attack that liberal Christianity was taking in its denial of the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, its denial of anything supernatural or miraculous, including the virgin birth and the miracles of Christ, its denial of substitutionary atonement, or replacement of just a moral influence theory, and its denial of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus. These are obviously major, major doctrinal problems and the fundamentalists arose to fight against those problems in, a, in really a grand struggle that took place in the 1920s, mainly here in the United States, as the very direction that the mainline denominations were going to take hung in the balance. And eventually the fundamentalists found themselves being pushed out of those mainline denominations. And so they started new denominations and they started new colleges and universities, new seminaries, new organizations and institutions. And that's the history of what we're studying starting on Tuesday and then today. Now we ended class on Tuesday talking about the issue of separation because that becomes a very important issue for the fundamentalists. The fundamentalists separate from liberal Christians. Now, remember, a liberal Christian is not really a Christian at all. Liberal Christianity is really apostate Christianity. And the fundamentalists rightly understood that biblical separation means that we have to separate ourselves from apostates. We read that quote from Charles Spurgeon last time based on 2 Corinthians 6, where Spurgeon, in an English context, was applying those same truths that we, you know, what fellowship can light have with darkness? None. So there has to be a separation that takes place. But then the question came with regard to secondary separation, because there were Bible-believing Christians who didn't think that separation from the mainline denominations was necessary. Remember, J. Gresham Machen called those folks the indifferentists. And the real issue for fundamentalists became, how are we going to respond then to these indifferentists? We're going to practice primary separation from apostates, but are we going to also separate from fellow believers who don't apply primary separation the way that we think they should? And so secondary separation, sometimes called ecclesiastical separation or second degree separation, becomes really the, the big question mark in the minds of many fundamentalists. 
And many of these fundamentals apply that second, second degree separation differently than others. So, so this is a big issue in the 1930s and 1940s. So we pick up in the PowerPoint there. Disagreements then primarily regarding the application of separation led to the establishment of a new organization in the 1940s called the National Association of Evangelicals for United Action. Now, Eventually the For United Action was dropped and it became known simply as the National Association of Evangelicals and that organization still exists today as sort of the parent organization of contemporary evangelicalism. Now, why did these younger fundamentalists, why did they want to start this organization? Well, two reasons. Number one, they felt like the older, more hardened fundamentalists were too quick to separate and therefore were too negative in their outlook. And so the, the evangelicals felt like the older generation of fundamentalists were too militant, too eager to fight. And the evangelicals wanted to be more friendly in their approach to other groups. The second reason goes back to what we talked about with the Scopes monkey trial. The younger generation of fundamentalists, this younger generation, the new evangelicals as they come to be known, they were afraid that fundamentalism had become so associated with sort of an outdated backwoods country bumpkin, you remember that quote from last time, approach to science and other things that it had completely lost its influence in society and the evangelicals were very concerned at trying to regain that influence in American society. And so they thought by distancing themselves from the older generation of fundamentalists they would be able to start a new path of influence in American society. So evangelicalism then is an outgrowth of fundamentalism. And it's an outgrowth of fundamentalism that from the very beginning wanted to be more friendly than the older, more militant fundamentalists and wanted also to regain that position of influence within society. And I, I think you'll see as we go through this that those two things have really led evangelicalism to where it is today. In some ways it's become too friendly and in other ways it's allowed that quest for influence to to lead it into positions of compromise when it comes to faithfulness to the gospel. All right, so this split historic fundamentalism into two main groups, and we will call those groups separatist fundamentalists, or just today fundamentalists, and new evangelicals, or today just evangelicals. But those are the two groups that come out of historic, evan, uh, historic fundamentalism. Uh, the separatist fundamentalists were represented by a group called the uh, ACCC. Carl McIntyre and the American Council of Christian Churches was started actually as a response to the Liberal Federal Council of Churches, uh, which today is known as the World Council of Churches, which is a completely liberal organization. And the Federal Council, uh, the American Council of, of Christian Churches, Carl McIntyre's group was the fundamentalist response to that liberal organization. The evangelicals felt that that ACCC and Carl McIntyre and others, that they were too staunch, too harsh, too militant in their stand against the liberals. And so they started the National Association of Evangelicals really as a friendlier alternative to the ACCC. All right. This young generation of fundamentalists felt that their movement was too critical, too polarizing, too anti-intellectual. They started a new movement, one in which the core beliefs of fundamentalism would be retained, but be presented in a nicer, more accommodating, more academically credible way. So in April of 1942, a group of 147 leaders met in St. Louis and started a new organization, the NAE, and that organization launches evangelicalism, new evangelicalism. Here is a very sophisticated timeline that I was able to put together. That's sarcasm, a bunch of block arrows, but it gives you an idea of what was happening in terms of the Christian landscape in the 20th century. As we come into the 20th century, we really just have 
Protestantism, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, Congregationalists being really part of that, even Anglicans, Episcopalians here in the United States. And the Protestants at the turn of the century in America were still led by Bible-believing Christians. But all of that changes in the 1910s and really comes to a head in the 1920s as we have these great battles in the denominations for control of the denominations. So the mainline denominations end up going liberal and splitting off from them are the historic fundamentalists. And we have a number of new groups that are started, like the Conservative Baptist Convention and the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches and the Independent Fundamentalist... Um, wow, I'm bad with acronyms today. What is going on? IFCA, Independent, Independent Fundamentalist Churches of America. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, these groups are started as a response to the mainline denominations that are going liberal at this time period. Then in the 1940s, historic fundamentalism splits into two branches. And you can see here that the new evangelicals split from separatist fundamentalists. Now, I've purposely put the mainline denominations on the left, and then you can see new evangelicals are kind of on the left with separatist fundamentalists on the right, because I think that represents how conservative these different groups are. Now on the far left of our timeline, we have the rise of Pentecostalism, which we've already talked about in this class. But you can see how Pentecostalism starts as its own unique movement. It actually came out of holiness Methodism, Wesleyanism. But in the 1960s, Pentecostalism influences the mainline denominations. That's the charismatic renewal movement. And then in the 1980s, Pentecostalism influences new evangelicals at Fuller Seminary, and that's the birth of the third wave. And so a little bit of what we talked about earlier with the rise of the charismatic movement, you can see here on this chart. The historic fundamentalists, by the way, considered Pentecostalism to be a cult. It was the new evangelicals who were much more open to Pentecostalism as being perhaps just another denomination. All right, the National Association of Evangelicals, as we mentioned, founded in 1942 by 147 really fundamentalists who didn't want to be fundamentalists anymore because they wanted to be more friendly and more accepted in society in terms of gaining an influence. In particular, they wanted to have an academic and intellectual influence on society. Early leaders included men like Harold Ockengay and J. Elwin Wright. And Ockengay in particular was appointed as the first president of the National Association of Evangelicals. He will later be the first president of a new school called Fuller Theological Seminary, which is going to be the flagship school of the new evangelicals. And later in his life, Ockengay is actually going to start another seminary uh, called Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary on the East Coast. Ockengay himself was a pastor in Boston, so even while he was president of Fuller Seminary, he continued to pastor a church in Boston. George Marsden, in his History of Fuller Seminary, says this, By 1947, fundamentalism seemed a cultural and intellectual wasteland. American opinion makers typically portrayed Bible-believing evangelicalism as a stifling vestige of the small-town past. The cultured elite saw current fundamentalist even evangelists as the denizens of tent meetings on the edge of town, hucksters of the airwaves, or the impresarios at high-pressured youth rallies, corrupting the young and, and exploiting the impressionable. So that's the opinion that society has of fundamentalism in the 1930s and 40s. Fundamentalist leaders, despite far larger constituencies than America's secular self-image would admit to, felt keenly, felt keenly their lack of respect at the centers of culture. Academia was especially tightly closed. Only rarely did a bona fide conservative Bible believer gain a significant university position. Universities were crucial to the future of the nation, and fundamentalist evangelicals could point to no nationally recognized scholar who spoke clearly for their cause. Most of their own scholars could gain little recognition outside the Bible conference circuit. And so, as Marsden is explaining this, this is the motivation for starting a new organization of evangelicals. 
And in 1947, this is the, or, this is the motivation for planting a new seminary, one which is going to hold to the fundamentals of the faith, but is going to be academically credible in the eyes of secular society, and they call it Fuller Theological Seminary. The founding of Fuller, then, was intended to be a response to contemporary American society's disdain for fundamentalism. And so Charles Fuller himself, Charles Fuller was a well-known radio evangelist of the early 20th century. He exclaimed that this new school would be the Caltech of the evangelical world. That was the goal. They wanted to be the MIT or the Caltech of evangelicalism. But... The legacy of Fuller Seminary proved, as it moved away from conservative evangelical principles toward a broader, more progressive position, it proved to be theologically disastrous. In the process, core evangelical principles like biblical inerrancy, one of the fundamentals, were jettisoned for the sake of academic credibility. And that really took place within about the first 15 to 20 years of Fuller's existence. All right, shortly before the founding of the NAE, in September 1941, here it is, Carl McIntyre and Harvey Springer organized the American Council of Christian Churches. I knew I had the acronym in here somewhere. It was more militant in its opposition to the Federal Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, also um, associated with the World Council of Churches, as we mentioned. McIntyre invented invited, excuse me, the, the National Association of Evangelicals to join the American Council of Churches, but they declined. And the, the reason they declined was because they didn't like how fundamentalists were so staunch in their application of secondary separation. They also didn't like the reputation that fundamentalists had within larger American social circles. Um, I'm going to skip the next few slides. The next few slides just provide evidence of that fact. Uh, But really the split between fundamentalism and evangelicalism is taking place now in the 1940s. And so the kind of older generation of fundamentalists, they're the ones who are more willing to take a stand and fight for the faith. The more militant fundamentalists, they go one direction. And the more friendly fundamentalists who are still interested in trying to have an influence in culture, call themselves evangelicals and go a different direction. You remember on Tuesday, I mentioned just at the end of class that Billy Graham really becomes a lightning rod of controversy in this whole conversation about fundamentalism and evangelicalism. Billy Graham grew up as a fundamentalist, and fundamentalism, of course, had really relished some of the ministries of the earlier evangelists like D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and others because it had represented a time in which they had great influence in American culture. So when Billy Graham started preaching and started gaining notoriety, especially at a Los Angeles crusade, was really where he started to gain the attention of the nation. Fundamentalists were very optimistic that they would once again have inroads And they were then shocked and disappointed when later, at a New York crusade, Billy Graham started working with liberal churches in his crusades. And the fundamentalists saw that as being a betrayal of that primary separation that had come to characterize their movement. So many fundamentalists separated then from Billy Graham and from anyone associated with Billy Graham, and they practiced then secondary separation towards Billy Graham. Graham himself began to to identify himself with the evangelicals, and he really became not the golden boy of fundamentalism, but he became, I suppose, the poster child of evangelicalism and one of evangelicalism's foremost leaders in the last 50 years. By the way, if you read Ian Murray's Evangelicalism Divided, he brings all of this to the forefront. You'll learn a lot about the ministry and history of Billy Graham and the BGEA. So Marsden says this, Graham's move toward the respectable centers of American life precipitated a definitive split with the hardline fundamentalists 
in 1957. For his New York City crusade, Graham accepted the sponsorship of the local Protestant Council of Churches, which was a liberal organization. Strict fundamentalists were deeply offended by his cooperation with liberals, and they anathematized Graham. In the aftermath of the resulting schism within the coalition, fundamentalism came to be a term used almost solely by those who demanded ecclesiastical separatism. They called their former allies neo-evangelicals, picking up on the term new evangelicalism, which was coined by Harold Ockengay. Others in the reforming group called themselves simply evangelical, the term that eventually became common usage both for them and for the wider movement. Recognizing that the emerging movement needed some intellectual guidance, Graham sponsored the establishment of Christianity Today under the editorship of Carl Henry, who was actually one of the early professors at Fuller Seminary. Ockengay was the chairman of the board. Most of the pieces were now in place for promoting their vision of a movement that would not only evangelize the nation, but would also lay the foundations for a unified evangelical social and intellectual program. And so really the, the three great initial catalysts for evangelicalism here in North America were Fuller Theological Seminary, the National Association of Evangelicals, and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And closely associated with that, of course, would be a periodical Christianity Today. All of this started as a way to, as Marsden actually says in his book on the history of Fuller Seminary, which is titled Reforming Fundamentalism, it was a way to reform and refine fundamentalism. We want to keep the fundamentals, but we want to be more friendly, and we want to have greater influence than the fundamentalists can, and so we drop the fundamentalist label and call ourselves evangelicals. That's the perspective that's represented by Gay and Graham and others in the 1940s. So today, many in separatist fundamentalist circles continue to place a high priority on separation, both primary and secondary. And so schools like Pensacola Christian College and Bob Jones University and others which would still retain the label fundamentalist and apply it to themselves in those circles separation is still a very big issue it has been called this is Bob Jones Jr. the very foundation and basis of a fundamental witness and testimony and, quote, a major scriptural doctrine taught from Genesis to Revelation. It was from the Bob Jones University Review. In fact, failure to practice ecclesiastical separation from any and all groups even remotely connected with apostasy or a compromised position is considered disobedience. And those are some fundamentalist sources that I am quoting there. Roland McCune, who teaches at Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a fundamentalist seminary, it would Detroit Baptist is in terms of doctrinal distinctives is almost identical to the Master Seminary. It's just on the fundamentalist side of the spectrum. But fundamentalists consider ecclesiastical separation to be a quote vital facet of the self identity of fundamentalism even noting that it is probably the most defining distinctive of fundamentalism today. And so when the, when the, when the evangelicals split with the fundamentalists, the evangelicals said, we're going to do everything in our power to cooperate with everybody else. The fundamentalists who remained essentially said, we're going to do everything in our power to separate from anyone who doesn't agree with the fundamentals. And so separation became the defining mark of fundamentalism, and it still is. Here in the Calvary Contender, when a leader abandons the fundamentalist position, he should relinquish his, relinquish his claim to the label. The confusion within our ranks would diminish if those who refuse to practice ecclesiastical separation would quit calling themselves fundamentalist and forthrightly call themselves evangelical. And then it goes on to talk about labeling. While fundamentalists do not label ecclesiastical separation as a fundamental doctrine, they do see it as essential 
to the point where they generally separate from those who do not apply separation in the same way that they do, and most fundamentalist churches will include separation in their doctrinal statement. This is just kind of a side note, but it's interesting that Roland McCune notes that a person could hold to King James only or to modern translations, to Arminianism or Calvinism, to Congregational rule or Elder rule, to Covenantalism or Dispensationalism, to Amillennialism or Premillennialism, to Non-Lordship or Lordship Salvation, and still be considered a fundamentalist as long as that person holds to things like ecclesiastical separation and usually a rejection of Christian contemporary music, which is the other big issue that fundamentalists rally around today. All right, on the flip side, evangelicalism quickly became a movement that didn't separate from anybody. So the reality is that fundamentalism perhaps represents an over-eagerness to separate. Evangelicalism ended up representing a refusal to separate from anything or anybody and became essentially completely compromised. Evangelicalism's fall from orthodoxy is most clearly seen in two of its original icons, Fuller Theological Seminary, and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. So here's Francis Francis Schaeffer. He says, Evangelicalism has developed the automatic mentality of accommodation at each successive point. Evangelicalism has done many things for which we should be thankful, but the mentality of accommodation is indeed a disaster. Phil Johnson. With the wild popularity of so many evangelical fads like 40 Days of Purpose, the lucrative success of the Christian publishing and contemporary Christian music industries, the growing influence of the emerging church phenomenon, and a recent cover story by Time Magazine featuring the 25 most influential evangelicals in America, lots of evangelicals might be tempted to think these are the best of times for their movement. My own assessment would be that evangelicalism's spiritual condition at the beginning of the 21st century is reminiscent of the medieval church just prior to the Protestant Reformation. No, I take that back. Things are much worse among evangelicals today than they were in the Catholic Church in those days. Modern and postmodern evangelical is just like medieval Catholicism was, only more superficial. (laughs) So there's Phil talking about where evangelicalism has taken us. And uh, that was in a Shepherds Conference seminar that he did. He's actually done several Shepherds Conference seminars dealing with this issue. And really his assessment has been that fundamentalism and evangelicalism should have never split because we need each other. We need the doctrinal, um, the doctrinal commitments and willingness to separate from apostasy that fundamentalism represents. But we also need some of the willingness to engage and willing and desire to influence that evangelicalism represents. We need both of those things. We need both doctrinal purity and a desire for unity. Both of those things should represent biblical Christianity. And when they split, Bible-believing Christians in America ended up going to two extremes because they didn't have the balance that was needed that was represented by the group that they split from. Often evangelicalism's unwillingness to separate from false teachers and worldliness was driven by a desire for greater influence in society. In an attempt to safeguard its message, fundamentalism lost its influence. In an attempt to gain an influence in society, evangelicalism lost the purity of its message. As a movement, evangelicalism compromised for the sake of academic credibility, political power, and cultural contextualization and accommodation. So Robert Godfrey writes this in his article, The Myth of Influence. For a long time, I have felt that the cause of biblical Christianity has been undermined in our time by sincere people who engage in unbiblical activities for the sake of being an influence. The sad and ironic result of those actions has been to harm the cause of Christ, and little or no good influence has actually occurred. The myth of influence seduces Christians into believing that by compromising important theological truths, more people can be influenced for Christ. Godfrey goes on, I am not opposed to the idea of trying to be an influence. Christians should hope, pray, and work to be a godly influence wherever they can in this world. The danger comes when Christians adopt a notion of influence derived from the world of politics or business. 
That world sees influence in relation to power, money, numbers, and success. Compromise, cooperation, and intentional ambiguity are all methods used to achieve influence in this world. But should Christians adopt strategies and set goals that compromise basic elements of their faith in the name of influence? Of course not. The most tragic consequence of the myth of influence is that those who embrace it often end up being influenced by the world rather than being a good influence on the world. For example, Godfrey writes, Fuller Seminary, in its efforts to be more influential by moving beyond its own fundamentalist roots, has abandoned basic evangelical doctrines such as the inerrancy of Scripture. And here George Marsden, talking about Fuller Seminary. At the School of Theology, the new curriculum of the 1960s reflected, so we're just 15 to 20 years in, that reflected the neo-evangelical intellectual agenda of being distinctly evangelical while at the same time producing scholarship so scientific that everyone would have to listen to it. A small incident from the mid-60s was, was later reported by a number of alumni as encapsulating the academic ethos of that time. A student noticed that the seminary sign could be much improved with a small scribal emendation. For several days it read appropriate. Fuller, the logical seminary. And they took out the O in theological. And that was because they had exchanged, again, a commitment to inerrancy. They had exchanged that commitment for a commitment to trying to be academically respected. Here Ian Murray talks about David Hubbard made president in 1963, despite the fact that he needed to reinterpret the seminary's stated position on Scripture. Under Hubbard, Fuller Seminary moved into the mainstream of the American churches, but it was at the cost of Scripture. Hubbard came to represent his predecessor's beliefs on inerrancy as the gas balloon theory of theology. One leak and the whole Bible comes down, unquote. By 1982, it is said that only about 15% of the student body in the School of Theology held to the conviction of the seminary's founders on inerrancy. In Carl Henry's words, Fuller Seminary moderated its initial biblical commitments and became infatuated with numbers, unquote. So evangelicalism, in its quest to be friendly and in its quest to be an influence, ended up compromising on the fundamentals of the faith. On the flip side, the fundamentalists, in an effort to be true to the fundamentals of the faith, put up such rigid walls of separation that they no longer had any influence outside of their own small circles in American society. Here's Godfrey talking about Billy Graham. Billy Graham began his ministry amidst the American fundamentalism of the 1940s. In the early days, he had strong support from fundamentalists like Bob Jones Sr. and John R. Rice. In 1951, Graham wrote, We do not condone nor have fellowship with any form of modernism. This is a fundamentalist statement, a position he reiterated to Rice in 1955. Yet by the New York City crusade in 57, that position had clearly changed. Graham had... Graham has defended his more cooperative approach to evangelism in these words. Quote, my own position was that we should be willing to work with all who were willing to work with us. Our message was clear, and if someone with a radically different theological view somehow decided to join with us in a crusade that proclaimed Christ as the way of salvation, he or she was the one compromising personal convictions, not we. The problem, however, Godfrey writes, was not just that Graham increasingly had liberal Protestants and Roman Catholics on his platform and committees, but that he sent inquirers back to those churches. As a matter of conviction, he wanted his work to serve the churches, but he also wanted to be an influence by having many churches involved and having large numbers attend. Cooperation with liberal Protestants and Roman Catholics was designed to increase the influence of the ministry with the aim of seeing more people converted. But in reality, all that happened was that more people were confused. That's my little editorial <laughs> addendum. Ian Murray, the reason why the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association decided to cooperate with liberals and other non-evangelicals was never set out in terms of principle. The fact is that the policy was seen as a necessary expedient designed sincerely for the best end, namely to gain a wider hearing for the gospel influence. Crusades depended upon crowds, and in the Graham story there is an almost ever-present concern for maintaining and increasing numbers. 
And then here's Ian Murray quoting Billy Graham, and he's quoting Graham from that infamous Robert Schuller interview that some of you may know about. But here's Graham. God is, quote, God is calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the non-believing world, they are members of the body of Christ because they have been called by God. They may not know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something they do not have, and they turn to the only light they have, and I think they are saved, and they are going to be with us in heaven. That's the end result of a long progression of compromise in cooperation for the sake of gaining influence, and the fundamentals of the faith get compromised and capitulated on in the process. All right, what, yeah, Daniel. When did he say this? Uh, this would have been, was it late 90s, this interview with? It, it, it's, fairly, it's fairly recent, like in the last 15 years, but I don't remember exactly uh, 15 to 20 years. <laughs> I don't remember exactly when it was that he said this. This was in a fairly, fairly well-known interview with Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller of the Crystal Cathedral. Formerly of the Crystal Cathedral. <laughs> I think the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has some sort of statement about this video saying that you know he's out of context. That they, that they were clearly embarrassed. Yes, the BGEA did immediately send out some PR um, materials to try and distance themselves from what Billy Graham himself had said in this interview. That is true. But if you listen to the interview, it's pretty clear what he said. And um, so. All right, after the 1940s, separatist fundamentalism was largely relegated to the margins of American society. It continued to focus on secondary separation and as a result lost much of its influence in the broader Christian world. Along with secondary separation, there were some moral issues that came to define fundamentalism, like a rejection of Christian contemporary music and in particular any sort of 2-4 beat or drums in music. Uh, there were some other social issues as well, uh, but those were less well known than the CCM issue, which is still a big issue in fundamentalist circles today. Evangelicalism, on the other hand, continued to gain major influence, both culturally and politically. However, its quest for influence caused many in the movement to compromise on the core tenets of the gospel. Okay, so we academic influence. We see it with Fuller Theological Seminary. By the way, when Fuller Seminary went south, a bunch of the faculty left and they started a new seminary, which we call Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. That is, I suppose, the faithful version of what Fuller Seminary was supposed to be. In terms of political uh, influence, you have the moral majority, you have the Christian coalition, you have focus on the family, these evangelical efforts to gain political influence. And even today, you have evangelicals saying, hey, let's work with Mormons, let's work with Catholics, let's, let's jettison the fundamentals of the faith in order to gain political clout in American society. I think that's a wrong-headed approach. Uh, as a result... Um, or, However, its quest for influence caused many in the movement to compromise the core tenets of the gospel. As a result, evangelicalism today is so broad that the label hardly means anything definitive. And that's true. I mean, people throw around the term evangelical and they refer to anything and everything between Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn to, on the flip side of that, I suppose, Rick Warren and Bill Hybels. It's all considered evangelicalism. All right, within both fundamentalism and evangelicalism, there remain those who are boldly committed to the fundamentals of the faith. Faithful pastors are those who remain committed to those core truths and are willing to stand for them in the midst of cultural pressure to capitulate. I would argue that at the center of the spectrum, on the right end of and meaning right in, in the sense of conservative, on the conservative end of evangelicalism, and on the left end of fundamentalism, 
that there is a core group of churches and institutions and men that still represent that historic fundamentalist conviction that we are going to stand for the fundamentals of the faith and we're going to be unified in our stand for the fundamentals of the faith. And I, th I think that's where conservative evangelicalism is. I think that is what it is and what defines it. The evangelical church today is again poised for another wave of Christian leaders who will courageously lead the church in biblical truth. In many ways, that brings us full circle to the Reformation. The key to seeing revival in the church is not to try and manipulate it through fads and gimmicks. Rather, it is to recognize the authority of Christ in His church, to proclaim His word, to preach the biblical gospel, and to do it all for His glory. And based on a commitment to those core truths, to be unified with fellow believers who are committed to those same things. And that unity is built on that doctrinal conviction. Having been faithful to those things, we can then trust God with the results. All right, so that brings us then to a, an end of this lecture on fundamentalism and evangelicalism. I would love to go much deeper on a lot of the history behind these things, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an understanding of how we got to where we are today. Where did evangelicalism come from? It came out of historic fundamentalism. But evangelicalism from its very beginning was supposed to be a friendlier, more intellectually acceptable, more influential form of fundamentalism. And sometimes in that quest for influence, evangelicals, evangelicals were tempted to compromise on the fundamentals and they sometimes, in my opinion, gave away the farm, so to speak, just to gain greater influence. We can't do that. So fundamentalists, they maintained their message but lost their voice. Evangelicals, they gained influence, they gained a voice, but once they got it, they had nothing definitive to say anymore. We need to be in balance between those two things. We want influence for the sake of the gospel, yes, but we can never compromise the message of the gospel in order to get it. Let's talk about a test. Exam number three, liberals and higher critics. There will be a section on the exam that addresses this, so you will want to uh, know a little bit about each of these items. Remember, the, I think the goal on this is to, because there's a lot of different individuals and a lot of items that you need to study for this exam, I think you are going to benefit yourself if you kind of see it big and keep it simple, meaning that you identify just the most significant things about each of these individuals and also that you prepare yourself to be able to distinguish them from other items on the list. So it's not enough to know that Rene Descartes was a philosopher. Uh, you need to know more than that because there's other philosophers on the list who you need to be able to distinguish him from. In particular, Rene Descartes was a 17th century philosopher, the, really the father of rationalism famous for his line, I think, therefore I am. He wrote a book called The Discourse on the Method, published around 1637, which is seen as kind of the book that sparked the Enlightenment. John Locke, the developer of empiricism, whereas rationalism says reason is the fountain of all knowledge, Empiricism says that science is the fountain of all knowledge, and rationalism together with empiricism become the two building blocks of Enlightenment thinking. The Age of Enlightenment is that period of time that came out of that, where we're rejecting religious tradition, we're rejecting divine revelation as our authority, and instead we're finding our authority in reason and science. Romanticism was a response to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. Romanticism said, well, there are no real answers in science and reason, so the, the, the purpose of life must be coming through self-fulfillment and through emotional enterprises, so art and beauty and music. These become the, uh, really the, the focus of Romanticism. It's a philosophical response to rationalism. Deism is the acknowledgement that there is a creator, but it's a denial of the biblical truth about God. Deism taught that there was a creator who made the world and then walked away, and he doesn't care about anything that happens. So it's, it's a practical atheism. Baruch Spinoza, 
was a 17th century Jewish, really Dutch Jewish philosopher who said that the Bible should be treated like any other human book. And so he denied inerrancy and inspiration and uh, really was a precursor to the later higher critics. Johann Eichhorn is considered the founder of modern Old Testament criticism. And uh, again, he denied the miraculous in the Old Testament, kind of building on Jean Ostruck and also Baruch Spinoza in terms of treating the Bible like it's just a human book, a denial of inspiration. Friedrich Schleiermacher is the father of modern liberal theology. Schleiermacher, because he encountered the arguments of rationalism, said he couldn't believe the Bible was true anymore. And so he needed a new foundation for his Christian experience. And he found that in feelings and in romanticism. And so he taught that the basis is the absolute feeling of dependence that a person has on God. That was his basis for his Christianity. F.C. Bauer, the founder of the Tübingen School of Theology, uh, certainly a higher critic. He was one who applied Hegelian dialectics to the Bible. Hegelian dialectics came out of philosopher George W.F. Hegel, uh, who taught this idea of that you have a thesis and then an antithesis, and then you come to a synthesis. Well, Bauer took that, applied it to the New Testament, and said there was the thesis, which was really the gospel according to James and Peter, which was sort of Christianized Judaism. And then there was the antithesis, which was the grace-based salvation of Paul. And then the early church came along, and they took this and created a synthesis, which is the New Testament. And Bauer's views were all disproven not long after his lifetime, but not before they did a great deal of damage in the church. David Strauss is the founder of the quest for the historical Jesus. The quest for the historical Jesus is the idea that the Jesus of history is not the same as the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible or the Jesus of faith is the Superman version of Jesus that was created by his followers. And we have to get past that to discover the real Jesus, which is the Jesus of history. Uh, he wrote a book called The Life of Jesus Critically Examined. It was translated into English and had a major impact in England, especially on an Anglican theologian named Benjamin Jewett. Benjamin Jewett, along with six other Anglicans, wrote a book in 1860s called Essays and Reviews. Jewett was a professor at Oxford, and this began to lay the influence of German higher criticism lay that foundation in England. A year before that, in 1859, a guy named Charles Darwin published a book called The Origin of Species, which introduced evolutionary biology into the mainstream. And you guys are all familiar with how prevalent evolutionary thinking is in modern society. Albrecht Ritchell like Schleiermacher, denied that the Bible could be the basis of the Christian faith. Instead of seeing it in romanticism and emotionalism, he or experientialism, he saw it in moralism. So Ritchell said that what makes Christianity Christian is when we are a good influence on society. So the atonement, justification, uh, those things are not about the individual sinner's salvation from sin. They're about the Christian church's influence on society as we save society from social ills. Julius Wellhausen is the founder of the documentary Hypothesis, the JEDP theory of the Pentateuch, that there were different sources involved and we can determine which source was involved by which word for God is used in a certain section. Adolf von Harnack wrote a book called What is Christianity? And he, kind of like David Strauss, he sought to peel back the layers. He, he viewed the Gospels like a kernel of corn. And you peel back the leaves of the kernel of corn to get to the actual corn. Well, the actual kernel is the Jesus of history. We have to peel back the layers of tradition. Hermann Gunkel was the originator of form criticism. Source criticism, like the 
documentary hypothesis tried to figure out what sources were behind the final product. Form criticism said, no, let's deal with the final product. And when we come to different forms in the gospel, like we might have um, parables is a form, or we might have a didactic section as a form, or we might have the Sermon on the Mount, sermons as a form. We're going to treat each of these forms differently and try and decide how they came to be. Again, all of this is premised on a denial that the Bible is what it actually claims to be, which is a supernatural, inspired, inerrant book that was written by the people whose names are associated with those biblical books. Uh, That denial undergirds all of this. Rudolf Bultmann applied form criticism then to the Gospels, And in particular, he did it to the synoptics and to the fourth gospel. With the fourth gospel, he taught that the fourth gospel was actually based on an earlier gospel called the signs gospel. And of course, with the synoptics, he taught that they were based on an earlier version called Q, the source gospel. Uh, Source criticism we've mentioned, form criticism we've mentioned, redaction criticism, redactors are editors. So redaction criticism is not looking at the source, which would be the beginning, not looking at the form, which would be the end, but it's looking at, it's trying to decipher the editors in the middle who change stuff. And uh, so the idea again is that perhaps the Bible books uh, were really oral traditions that were written down and then editors changed them. And then a later editor changed it again and a later editor changed it maybe a third time. Let's find out who those editors were to see if we can understand how this came to be. Um, It's a lot easier to just believe that the Bible is what it claims to be than to spend your time trying to figure out something that is completely false in its initial premise. But anyway, I get annoyed at the liberals, especially the German liberals. My heritage is German, so I feel like I can get annoyed at them with good reason. The Germans did a lot of bad stuff in the 18th, uh, in the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, the theology of Germany in the 19th century was terrible, and the politics of Germany in the 20th century was terrible, as they tried to take over the world twice. Um, so it didn't work. All right, <laughs> neo-orthodoxy was the response to German liberalism by guys like Karl Barth and Emil Brunner, and uh, there's a section in the notes that I would encourage you to look at at the end of the liberal section that goes a little deeper into neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy didn't quite get to orthodoxy. So it was closer, it was a step back in the right direction, but didn't quite get there. So for example, Bart has great understanding of God's sovereignty, and yet at the same time has some really troubling views on things like scripture. Uh, He didn't see Scripture as the Word of God, but saw it rather as a means to get to the Word of God, kind of a mystical approach to Scripture. And he was never clear on whether or not he embraced certain things like the bodily resurrection of Christ, which, of course, the fundamentalists rightly regarded as a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. I mean, Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus did not rise bodily from the grave, then our faith is worthless. All right, moving on. The missions movement. John Eliot was known as the Indian Apostle, and he translated the Bible into the Algonquin language very early on in American history in terms of the Puritan influence on American history. Thomas Mayhew was another early evangelist to the Indians. He and his descendants were in Martha's Vineyard and were very friendly to the Indians there and saw many of them come to Christ. David Brainerd, another missionary to the Native American Indians, both in Massachusetts and in, um, I believe it was in Connecticut. And Brainerd is familiar to us because even though he died when he was only 29 years old, he left a great influence on Jonathan Edwards, and it was Brainerd's memoirs, which when published by Edwards, helped to spark the modern missions movement when they influenced guys like William Carey. William Carey is considered the father of the modern missions movement. Jonathan Edwards, you should know. William Carey is considered the father of the modern missions movement. He was a shoe cobbler in England, 
who determined that he needed to go to India. And uh, he was involved in Bible translation there. Adniram Judson, really one of the first American missionaries, a Congregationalist who, while he was sailing to India to meet up with William Carey, studied the issue of baptism and became a Baptist. When he got to India, he couldn't stay there because the British East India Company didn't want Americans. I mean, the year was 1812. We were at war with Britain in that year. And so he left and went to modern-day Myanmar, Burma, and uh, had a great ministry there. Hudson Taylor was not the first missionary to China. That was Robert Morrison, but he was the first missionary to infiltrate the interiors of China, at least in the modern age. We know, of course, that Christianity had come to China by at least the 7th and 8th centuries, but in the modern sense, Hudson Taylor was one of the first, set up the China Inland Mission. David Livingston, an explorer and also missionary to Africa. Cults, cultural Christians, and charismatics. Uh, Really, Mormonism, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, that should be somewhat familiar to you. Seventh-day Adventists, William Miller and Ellen G. White, we talked quite a bit about. Christian Science and Mary Baker Eddy, Uh, She was the one who taught that all illness was just in your head. Jehovah's Witnesses started through the Bible study or Bible student movement of Charles Taze Russell. And um, that's early 20th century. After his death, his movement kind of fractured and the Jehovah's Witnesses were one of those fracturing groups. Russell had started the Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. And so the Jehovah's Witness is still known as the Watchtower Society. The temperance movement got started in the 17th, excuse me, in the 1700s, in the 18th century, when a doctor named Benjamin Rush taught that intoxicants like alcohol had negative health effects. Uh, it seems pretty obvious that alcohol has negative health effects, but modern medicine is just getting going at this time, and he determines that uh, alcohol is bad, and uh, especially drunkenness is bad. Drunkenness certainly had massively negative effects on society at the time, and so Christians joined together to try and get alcohol outlawed and finally were successful in America in the 18th Amendment. Uh, The Goodwill Organization, the YMCA, and uh, the Salvation Army, three uh, broadly Christian organizations that were started to help meet social needs in 19th century America at a time when the government did not provide those services. Edgar J. Helms started the Goodwill Industries in Boston around 1900. Uh, the Salvation Army was started in America shortly after it was founded in England. The YMCA started in 1851 as the Young Men's Christian Association and the YWCA in 1866 as really a ministry to street kids, uh, giving them a place where they could go and be influenced for the gospel when when they weren't at other places. Uh, The social gospel, we see that influence in America through guys like Washington Gladden, who's considered the father of the social gospel in America. He was a Congregationalist minister who was influenced by a guy named Horace Bushnell, who was a liberal. Um, We'll talk about him more a little bit later. Charles Sheldon wrote the famous book, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? Walter Rauschenbusch was the real popularizer of the social gospel in America. In 1907, he wrote Christianity and the Social Crisis. He was influenced by the German Albert Ritchel, and so we see the connection there. Liberalism is Christianity without the Bible. So not Christianity. Uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was one of the outspoken liberal pastors of the early 20th century. In the great battles between the fundamentalists and the liberals for the control of the mainline denominations, Fosdick preached a famous sermon called, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And the implication was we can't let these backwards, Bible-believing, anti-intellectuals take control of the future of Christianity in America. That was the liberal perspective. Pentecostalism, we talked about Charles Parham, Agnes Osmond, the girl who 
reportedly spoke in Chinese. On January 1st, 1901, Charles Parham was the Methodist pastor who encouraged her and others to do that. They did it in Topeka, Kansas at his little Bible institute there and Pentecostalism was born. William J. Seymour was a later student of Parham in Texas. He came out here to Los Angeles, preached in Nazarene circles that the second blessing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit meant speaking in tongues, really got the Pentecostal movement started. Or at least uh, the momentum for it really came out of that. The charismatic renewal of the 1960s was when a pastor named Dennis Bennett spoke in tongues at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Van Nuys, California. So all four of those are related. This was the introduction of Pentecostal theology into the mainline denominations. The third wave started in the 1980s when, the, when a pastor, the founder of the Vineyard Church in... Uh, not La Mirada, but Anaheim, Anaheim, California. John Wimber, uh, he was also teaching at Fuller Theological Seminary. He and another full-time professor at Fuller named C. Peter Wagner uh, really introduced Pentecostal theology, the signs and wonders movement, power evangelism, and those kinds of things into the evangelical church. So it's, it's actually not very surprising that Pentecostalism really emphasizes experientialism over a commitment to biblical truth. And so we see that influence in the mainline denominations because they had abandoned the Bible already. So there's the platform set. Fuller Theological Seminary abandons inerrancy. And what happens? We see it becoming the catalyst for the third wave movement. All right. The Roots of Fundamentalism, New Haven Theology and Nathaniel Taylor. New Haven Theology was an attempt to make Calvinism more respectable by making it Arminianism. So undoing Calvinism, that was Nathaniel Taylor's New Haven Theology. One of his students who actually went much farther than Nathaniel Taylor was a man named Horace Bushnell, who essentially embraced liberalism and called it progressive orthodoxy. Kind of like Brian McLaren in his Generous Orthodoxy. The book is generous, but it's not orthodox. Horace Bushnell was progressive, but he was not orthodox. He was the one who then influences Washington Gladden for the birth of the social gospel in America. Princeton theology is fundamentalism before the fundamentalists. It is the theology of Princeton Theological Seminary under guys like Archibald Alexander, Charles Hodge, Charles Hodge's son, A.A. A. Hodge, then B.B. B. Warfield, and finally J. Gresham Machen, who I have listed a little bit later down. But these are the guys who stood faithfully and intellectually uh, against uh, liberalism in the 19th century. There were certainly others who did as well, but they were the ones really standing at the, at the forefront of an intellectual defense against modernism in the 19th century. Um, if you're looking for this in the larger section of notes, these guys, Charles Hodge through B.B. Warfield and others, are on page 288 of the larger set of notes. And I'll be giving you a few page numbers here as we go through to uh, direct you as to where to find more on these guys. Uh, starting on page 296, we have the 19th century evangelists, late 19th century, mid to late 19th century evangelists. So D.L. Moody we talked about in this class, and um, Billy Sunday we talked about in this class. Sam Jones and Rodney Gypsy Smith and A.J. Gordon are also evangelists of that time period. And so you're going to want to go back to page 296 and following to fill in the gaps on those guys. Uh, James Brooks and C.I. Schofield are right there in that same context in the notes. These are some of the early fundamentalist leaders. Schofield, in particular, was a former Confederate soldier. I mean, we're right around the time of the Civil War and then shortly thereafter. In the 1860s is when the Civil War took place. Schofield was a former Confederate soldier who then helps to organize early fundamentalists. He's highly involved in the Niagara Bible Conference, which we talked about. And of course, Schofield is well known because he leaves us with a reference Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. 
Uh, the Niagara Bible Conference was that early fundamentalist conference that developed the 14-point Niagara Creed, which uh, laid out some of the early tenets of fundamentalism. Uh, other Bible conferences include the Northfield conferences that D.L. Moody was involved in, and also, of course, the establishment of new fundamentalist schools like Moody Bible Institute and the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which, of course, today we call Biola, Biola University. Uh, the fundamentals were those articles that were written by fundamentalists published between 1910 and 1915. Charles Briggs, Henry P. Smith, and A.C. McGifford were three Presbyterian seminary professors who were all put on trial for heresy and defrocked. And you can find details about them starting on page 309. William Jennings Bryan, of course, famous for his involvement in the Scopes Monkey trial. He defended, he, excuse me, he prosecuted John Scopes, who was that evolutionary biology teacher in Tennessee. J. Gresham Machen was like the last fundamentalist at Princeton who left Princeton and went and started Westminster Theological Seminary. He also got kicked out of the PCUSA, and so he started a new Presbyterian denomination called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, OPC. Around the same time, Robert Ketchum started the General Association of Regular Baptists, and the Conservative Baptist Association was started at around the same time. These are fundamentalist associations and organizations started as a re response to the rise of liberalism. You can find more about the GARBC on page 320 and following. Other Presbyterian organizations, the Bible Presbyterian Church, started by Carl McIntyre, the same one who was the founder of the American Council of Christian Churches. And then you have the Reformed Presbyterian Church, the PCA, and others. IFCA started around the same time. And even guys like John Walvoord of Dallas Seminary was a president of IFCA, involved in its early beginnings. Uh, ACCC, we talked about Carl McIntyre, and then the National Association of Evangelicals was... Harold Ockengay and those who wanted to be more friendly and more influential than the hardline fundamentalists represented by the ACCC. John R. Rice was an early fundamentalist leader. Uh, he is known for his publication called The Sword of the Lord and also significant because for a very long time he was a defender of Billy Graham. In fact, he was probably the longest lasting fundamentalist defender of Billy Graham until Billy Graham finally went so far in working with liberals that even John R. Rice couldn't support him anymore. Bob Jones Sr. was a Methodist pastor, who evangelist, who started a school in Greenville, South Carolina, called Bob Jones University. And then finally, the rise of new evangelicalism. We have... Harold John Ockengay, he was the first president of the National Association of Evangelicals. He was the first president of Fuller Theological Seminary. He was the first president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He was also a good friend of Billy Graham and very influential in the New York Crusade of 1957, where Graham started working with liberal Protestants. Fuller Theological Seminary was started in 1947. It was an attempt to maintain the fundamentals of the faith, but be intellectually respectable while doing that. About 20 years in, they realized they had to give on one of those two goals, and so they ended up compromising on the fundamentals of the faith, specifically a denial of inerrancy. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School is an offshoot of Fuller. When the faculty, the original founding faculty at, seminary, at the seminary saw Fuller going a direction they didn't want it to go, they left and started TEDs. Gordon Conwell, we've mentioned already, started by Harold Ockengay. Carol, uh, excuse me, Carl, not Carol. Carl F.H. Henry was one of the original founding faculty members of Fuller and later became the first editor-in-chief of Christianity Today magazine. E.J. Carnell 
was the second president of Fuller. He was one of the founding faculty members, president after Ockengay. He was a big apologist, wrote a book on apologetics that he thought was going to convince all of the skeptical unbelievers in the world that Christianity is rationally acceptable. It didn't do that, and he was so distressed and discouraged as a result of that, probably other factors, that he ended up committing suicide. Billy Graham. Uh, you guys know who Billy Graham is. Christianity Today. You know what Christianity Today is. And the Master's Seminary. Oh, look, I put that in there just for fun. Where does the Master's Seminary come from? The Master's Seminary came from Talbot Theological Seminary, which was started as the seminary of Biola University. So Biola was a fundamentalist school, started a seminary called Talbot. And when, when Talbot started to make some decisions with regard to accepting women students into its program and a few other factors there were some faculty that decided they needed to leave and uh, an extension campus was already here and so this extension campus became the master seminary in 1986.